All right. Well, good morning and happy Monday to everyone. Uh, this is Mr. Greg here. And I want to welcome you all to another uh, morning, another installment of the Getting Radical in the Word Bible Study Series. Um, this is an opportunity for us as a community to come together and dive deeper and more intentionally in God's Word. Uh, we've been doing this for a couple of months now, for a few months now, uh, rather. And um, if you're here, uh, this is your first time or your 50th time or whatever, um, I know that uh, you're going to be blessed because it has been a blessing to us each and every day. So uh, today I am ex uh, excited to uh, be going over Romans chapter 7 from the new uh, King James Version. Um, this the Romans is a very well-known critical book in understanding the gospel as well as uh, just its 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 uh, importance and its uh, importance and and influence that that's the word influence in our Christian theological and doctrinal understanding. But before we begin, uh, I want to remind us of the framework of observation that we've been using to study, um, and that's using the acronym space. Right by space, we're trying to search the word to discover uh, is there a sin that is in the text in the scripture that uh god is calling and inviting us to confess is there a promise for us to claim or is there an attitude that we can change c is there a command to obey and e is there an example for us to follow and as we've been doing daily we've been using that acronym and we're going to use it again on today so as we dive into romans 7 uh let's just keep that space acronym in mind so uh, as well as feel free to drop any observations that you have, any encouraging insights into the uh, chat box uh, so that we can all grow together in the word. Uh, so with all that being said, let's begin with a word of prayer and in God, invite God's spirit to be with us. Lord, we simply say thank you. We say thank you for this opportunity and this space for us to come together to dive into your word, to see what you're saying to us, Lord. Uh, Father, I pray that your spirit makes it clear, makes it plain, God, and I pray that your spirit Speak, speaks to us and talks to us in our hearts. Uh, we look forward to what we're going to experience in these next few moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Romans chapter 7, beginning um, at verse 1 in the New King James Version. And here's what the word says. Uh, or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. Verse 3. So then if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Verse 6. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now, uh, I'm going to pause right there. Uh, now, in order for us to understand what Paul, the writer of Romans, is trying to say here, I got to do a little bit of background work, right? Um, because the language, the words, kind of the phrases that's used in Romans 7 can sometimes be hard to follow at times. But we have to understand that Paul is writing in Romans 7, it comes as a continuation of the claim that he makes in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, which was, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. He says that in Romans 6, 14. I'm going to say that again. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What Paul is attempting to explain more completely in Romans 7 is how we are no longer under the dominion law. Rather, we are under the law of grace. 
Paul states this truth and makes this claim because the primary audience, you have to get this, the primary audience in which Paul is writing the entire book of Romans 4 to was, was to Christ following Gentiles. That's who he's writing to. He's writing to people who had accepted Jesus, but were not converted as Jews. It was not for the Torah keeping Jews. It wasn't for the primary religious folk. It was for people who had fallen, lived all type of way, but are now following Christ. Why is this important? Because Paul believes that God is a God for not just for the Jews only, that's the Jewish elitist way of thinking. Paul believes that God is a God for everyone. So the mission in the book of Romans was to bring about an understanding of how Jews and Gentiles can live together under one God because they lived under the law of grace. So when Paul begins writing Romans 7, he writes it to people who have been experiencing tension and differences in what it looks like to live as a Christian. Right? They're experiencing modern they, these tensions, such as you know, worship styles, or if we think about modern day tensions, worship styles, ordination, men or women, types of food, all of these things, right? Paul, what Paul is trying to do in Romans 7 is communicate that those doctrinal cultural practices don't necessarily matter because we're not under the law. Rather, we're under the law of grace. Paul is trying to communicate what life looks like when you're under the grace, all right? So when we observe what's happening in verses one through seven, Paul attempts to expand upon this idea that we're under grace through this analogy of marriage, right? If you're married to someone, you by law are bounded to that person, you're committed to that person, there's no going outside of that person. However, if that person dies, you're no longer subjected to that person. He's trying to communicate that you are free to remarry, if you will, free to date, free to do whatever you please. Paul uses this analogy to illustrate that when Christ died, here it is, when Christ died, we were set free. This is good news because what it tells me is that because we are living under grace, we are set free. We're set free from the confines of religion. We're set free from tradition. We're set free from the chains that bound us daily. We're set free from depression, set free from guilt, set free from shame. We're set free from heartaches and pain. You are set free from trying to work out your own salvation. And so what I see is an attitude that we ought to have. We ought to have an attitude that we need to walk around with a mindset that we are free. An attitude that walks about around knowing that we have been set free from human and cultural standards, free from traditions, free from old spirits, free to have an attitude to profess that we are living in a new spirit. When we realize that we are under the law of grace, we can walk around knowing I'm free, right? There's a song that says, I'm free indeed. In Christ, I'm free indeed. Listen, when we adopt that, um, that, 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 that idea, when we adopt that, that reality that, yo, we're free, yo, that changes everything. So Paul is really trying to communicate, hey, listen, you can be free, right? Uh, 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 simply because Christ died. Christ's death free us. Uh, we have someone in the chat that says, hey, there's a promise to claim verse four. We have died to the law. Sin does not have dominion over. We are now united in, with Christ. When we are united with Christ, that is freeing, y'all. That is so freeing. Another uh, chat, uh, comment in the chat says, an attitude to adopt. We serve God, not according to the old letter of the law, but according to the spirit. Yes, when, when we are adopt this um, um, attitude of just being free, we can walk in a newness of life. We can walk in a newness of the spirit. So that's, that's just a couple of things I'm, see I'm seeing from the, from the uh, Romans 7. So let's continue with the reading. Starting at verse 7, New King James Version. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I uh, uh, would have not known covet to, covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Verse 8. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. 
I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So listen to what's happening, right? Uh, Paul is continuing to expound upon his argument of what life looks like when you're under grace. Remember, he's speaking to Christ following Gentiles. But in this portion of the argument, Paul is addressing whether or not the law has purpose, even if one is saved by grace, right? Paul is claims that the law is in fact good because it reveals sin to us. But notice in verse eight, right? This is cr critical to this part. He says that, but sin taking an opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. Paul is communicating that it is our sinful nature that perverts the commandments and makes it evil. He is saying that the commandments are not bad, rather we make them bad by calling, by making them a call to action of do's and don'ts rather than a visual laid in front of us. One commentary writes that once God draws a boundary for us, we are immediately enticed to cross that boundary, which is no fault of God or his boundary, but the fault of our sinful hearts. hearts. We have to understand, y'all family, that the commandments were never designed as a primary uh, uh, action for us to do things. The commandments were primarily designed for us to see something, okay, right? The point of the commandments given in Exodus 20 was not necessarily the actual 10 commandments. What was important of the commandments was the preamble to the commandments that came in verse two, right? We always start the commandments on verse three in Exodus 20. You shall have no other gods before me. Uh, you shall not make yourself a carved image. But we forget that the commandments actually begin in verse two when God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. The commandments were set up for us to first see God as our deliverer. It was designed for us to see God as the primary giver of grace. And we have made the commandments our set of boundaries rather than the visual laid out for us to see God. And so when I see this, that is a sin for us to confess. We have to confess, confess that at some point in our lives, we have perverted the commandments. We have made those the, the, the human standard of, of life. We've made those things boundaries and said, if we do those things or we don't do those things, that's going to be the centerpiece of our salvation. Whereas Paul is saying, no, that's our sinful nature putting that upon the commandments. The commandments are there for us to see who God is and to see God as a God of grace. And when we begin to see God as a God of grace, then we'll be able to live out the beauty of the commandments. You see, I grew up in this uh, uh, West Indian Adventist tradition. That was my tradition. And no shade, I love my West Indian. Shout out to Ogis. Uh, uh, that's who we are, right? Uh, but I grew up with this tradition and this mindset that was bounded to the law. If you don't go to church, you're not living right. If you dress a certain way, you're not living right. Uh, you have to do this or you can't do this. I had, in my life, had to be set free from that way of thinking because I set that as the standard of my salvation. I made the commandments evil because I missed God in it. I made it evil. But the good news that Paul is trying to communicate to these people is when you live life under, or when you realize that you're living under the law of grace, you actually live in balance. You live in a balance in knowing that, yes, I am set free and I can live the commandments because I'm free. I see God as the centerpiece of it, and I don't see me as the centerpiece of it. I don't see my actions at the center at the centerpiece of it. Comments say, hey, the evil desires that are inside of me pointed out by the law. Yeah, that is a sin for us to confess. 
Someone wrote an attitude to adopt. The law is holy and just and good. Yes. Someone also put there is a sin to confess in verse 15. We're getting there, right? So let's, let's get there. So Romans 13 through 25, it says, uh, has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good. So that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know, that's verse, verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, Paul says, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but it's the sin that dwells in me. Verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. That if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Verse 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Verse 25 to close. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul does something very interesting at this point in this last part of Romans 7. He begins by identifying he himself as a carnal being. He begins to share how there is a sin that is in him and it's by way of his flesh and that nothing good in him dwells. The reason why I find this to be interesting is because Paul is admitting that his flesh is evil. Paul is admitting that he is a sinner when he has already been converted. Paul is admitting that he is struggling after he is converted. Paul is no longer Saul at this point. He's, he's no longer a persecutor of the Jews. He's no longer a Christian hater. In fact, he is an apostle, a leader in the church, and he has been bringing many people into Christ. Paul, who has already been a uh, uh, Paul, who has already been a leader, been, who's already been transformed, he is sitting here admitting that he is a sinful being. Paul shows us that just because you know Jesus doesn't mean you don't have problems. He shows us that when you are under the law of grace, you can admit that you're still a work in progress. And this is an example for us to follow. We need to be real about what we go through. We need to, to be honest about our experiences, right? We need to remove this veil of everything is all right because uh, 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 we're, 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 we're a Christian today. No, there are certain days where Sabbath is not a happy day for us. There are certain days where we're just tired and we're frustrated. There are certain days where we don't have it all together. And I just need you to know that that's okay. Paul is saying to these people like, listen, I'm not okay. I struggle. I have my issues. That's an example for us to follow. But here's the good news that we close with. Paul admits his wretchedness by saying, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul professes that the reason he is able to move forward and live serving God, even though he is in a body of flesh, is because of Jesus. And this is the promise that we can claim. And it is this, Jesus delivers. Living under the law of grace allows us to live free in knowing that even though you don't have it all together, it's all right because we serve a Jesus who delivers us. We serve a Jesus who delivers us. And that's good news for us to take. And due to time, listen, that's all we got time for today. I can go all day on this, but unfortunately I can't. Um, and so I thank you all for joining. I pray that you all were blessed and that the spirit downloaded something into your spirit. 
Um, if any of you would like to become a, a reader and would like to you know, share with us one morning, please contact Pastor O'Geese. You can do so at 615-370-8690. 8690, that's 615 367 8690 if you want to be a part of this reading as well. Um, but as we uh, close out, let's close in prayer, family. Lord, we simply thank you that we are living under the law of grace, the grace in knowing that we are free, free indeed, God, that we can walk around with that attitude. Lord, so we confess our sin today that, Lord, we too have, have, have perverted the commandments. We too have bounded ourselves to the law, Lord, in a way that was not in your intentions. Lord, help us to see Christ in the commandments. Help us to see you and use the commandments as a visual laid out to what our lives can be like, God, when we center you. And so, Lord, help us to follow that example that Paul did, Lord, to follow the example that we can admit when things are not okay. And we can do that simply because we have the promise laid out in front of us that we serve a Jesus who delivers. Thank you for delivering us. Thank you for freeing us. Thank you for always being there. Thank you for being in the midst of us on this morning. Thank you, God, for all that you've done. I pray for everyone listening and tuned in right now, God. I pray that you bless them and keep them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you all for joining us. I pray that you all have an awesome week. God bless you. Love you all. Bye-bye.